Hi, this is James from Tabletop Gaming Guild, and today we're going to take a look at Cult of the Deep. This is published by BA Games, and it's a high player count game. It goes between four and eight players. In this game, you're going to have hidden roles and secret agendas, and you're trying to suss out what roles other players have in order to either help them or vanquish them to win. Let's go ahead down to the table here. I'll give you a general overview, quick overview of how the game plays, and then we'll come back and I'll give you my final thoughts. All right, so this is Cult of the Deep. Now, there's a couple different things we're going to go over with Cult of the Deep, um, but this is what a eight-player setup would look like. You're going to need to look at the rules to see however many of these ritual boards you're going to put out for based on the player count but um, you'll start off by putting out the ritual board number that you're supposed to and then you're going to place out these um, rituals to each place if they have a icon here and here you'll move these up uh, to those spots uh, if they just have one you'll move the top part up and just the bottom part down to zero we'll go over what that does in a second but there's a couple really other important setups for the game. You're going to look at the setup uh, for the game to see what mix of cards you're going to be using uh, for the player count. So for a five-player game, like you're going to be using a High Priest, a Faithful, two Cabalist, a Vengeful Heretic, and three Altar Boards. So there's your Altar Board count right there. Six-player, you're going to be using three Altar Boards, a High Priest, Faithful, three Cabalist, and a Repentant Heretic. We'll go over what all those mean in a second. Seven is going to be High Priest, two Faithful, three Cabalist, Vengeful Heretic, and four Altar Boards. And finally, eight players going to be the High Priest, two Faithful, four Cabalist, and a Repentant Heretic. Now, the way you're going to win these games is going to be based on the role that you have been given. Uh, so, the High Priest is always has to be in every game, and... Whoever has the High Priest, this one's the only one that's going to be a revealed uh, role. And at the start of the game, it says here you gain three additional life per Cabalist in the game. So you're going to look at that sheet to see how many Cabalists are in, and then you get more life based on that. You win if all the Cabalist and the Heretic die while you remain alive. And you lose upon death. All right, so the game will end when the High Priest um, dies and you can see that uh, in here also uh, they give like a chart so I believe it's uh, in the back of the book somewhere a chart that you can look at to see all the different like how they'll uh, interact with each other but anyway uh, so that everything really revolves around the high priest uh, that repentant heretic we're going to do it in a second but the, the other ones are cultists cover or cabalists sorry so cabalists win if the high priest dies and at least one of your cabalists live. Uh, grave vengeance. If every cabalist, including you, is dead, you may only win if the heretic is the last player alive or everyone dies, or if the high priest dies before anyone else wins. So you have a different win condition here if you die. And the cool thing about this game, unless you're the high priest, because the game will end based on you, um, you... Dying doesn't end the game for you. If the game hasn't ended, you can become a Wraith, which is this deck here, which we'll go over in a minute. Uh, so next, uh, we have the Faithful. We'll go to the Faithful next. Uh, you win if the High Priest is alive and all Kapalist and Heretic die. So um, the High Priest, notice the High Priest will win if the Kapalist and the Heretic die, but doesn't have to kill the Faithful. Uh, you lose upon the high priest death. So that's how those guys work. Then we have the repentant and vengeful heretic. So you notice like on the uh, lower pay, play counts, you're going to end with the vengeful one and the higher ones generally you're going to have the uh, repentant. So the repentant, you win if you are the last player alive or everyone dies. Now, if you end up to this deathbed, you end up dying. While dead, you win if all Kabbalahs die or everyone dies. However, you won't win if the high priest wins due to your death. Lose upon the high priest's death 
while at least one Kabbalist survives. So that's how you lose with it. That's a repentant heretic. So you actually, that uh, dying changes your stuff up. Same with this guy. Uh, you win if you are the last player alive or everyone dies. Wraithful retribution. While dead, you win if the high priest dies and at least one Kabbalist is alive or everyone dies. Lose upon the high priest's death, you will, while you and at least one other Kabbalist survives. So that's the roles and that's how they interact. In the beginning of the game, you're going to um, look at that pool of cards you're going to have and you're going to randomly assign a card. Now, just to uh, make things simple, we'll go ahead and make it a Kabbalist. This will be face down. The high priest will be face up, whoever that's for. Uh, so we know, now remember, this is going to be face down, not face up, but I'm going to leave it face up so you can see. So we're going to have that as our Kabbalist. But the next thing we're going to do is we randomly get a sigil. So everyone randomly gets a sigil, and it's a pretty large deck. So those will all go out. And these sigils here will give you your... Uh, your extra power during the game. This is face down so people don't see it until they need to see what's happening. During any player's resolve phase, choose a player to lose for life. So this will need to be face up uh, after the game starts so you can do this action. And this is your response, which we'll go over in a second. If you are killed, you may choose to use this card immediately and the player who killed you loses six life. So really nice, uh, instead of losing it, when you turn into a Wraith, um, you can use it one last time to do some cool stuff. And another thing I wanted to point out real quick um, before we finish up the last portion on here is there's a really nice player guide that goes over the phases for the game. Uh, the last thing you're going to do is you're going to look at this deck. We're going to shuffle it up, and you're randomly going to get a roll in here. Now, one thing to note is there is a Necromancer. If this is your first game ever, uh, it's recommended we don't play with a necromancer. Basically, what the necromancer does is it can revive you if you're in the uh, wraith mode uh, and bring you back to life. So, if your first couple games or whatever, or people haven't played before, keep this one out. You're just going to get your guardian, or not your uh, main character role, and a couple things that this is going to do. So, here's your health. This is how much health you have. So, I have 16 health in here. This is my personal. Uh, 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 in, uh, symbol and if I have this then I can fire stuff off on here uh, and so I can dock dice on here so during any living players response phase you may change uh, one this is a double damage card to a single damage once per turn during any player's turn when someone loses life due to a ritual you may prevent one life from being lost once per turn so these are two really cool abilities that this card has now, one thing I did want to clarify is I did misspeak a little bit. This is a one-time use sigil, so you can only use it once. Once it's used, it's, uh, it's done. So I can either use it for this four life or six life, but I can only use it one time. And it'll remain face down until you use it. So, sorry about that. I was going over this a little quickly and misspoke. So, that's basically set up, and that's what you're going to get in this game. And there's, like I said, there's tons of different... Like there's so many different characters you can be in this. So there's so much replayability in this game. It's insane. Uh, also, uh, these are really cool bags that hold the different chips in it. Like this is gonna be your uh, damage token, your blood tokens. Uh, this is gonna be uh, gold. This is your silver that you use later on. And this is um, bronze or whatever, but those are your coins that you're gonna be using throughout the game. All right, so let's go on to what you do throughout your turn and for the rest of the game. All right, so basically what you're going to do is you're going to roll cultist dice. Um, so you're going to roll five cultist dice. All right, and this is going to be Yahtzee style. So basically I'm going to roll. I'm going to pick which ones I want. So maybe I want to keep that damage. I get to roll again. Uh, maybe I'll keep this damage. I'll keep this one just to explain what happens. And um, that's my final roll. All right, so what's going to happen is now... Uh, that I've rolled, I get to assign the dice. So when I assign the dice on the board here, um, I can pick, so these ones have a couple different sides. This side will do one damage, and then I have this side, and I can do two damage. Unless it's the icons here, um, I'm going to have to assign these to other players. So maybe I want to do three damage to an opponent, so I'll set that over to that opponent. 
Uh, these ones here will heal me, so I will be able to heal uh, my character on there. And the other ones are symbols that uh, correspond to different things on the board. So let's go first and say that I want to assign this die here. Okay, so let's say I want to assign two dice here even. Maybe I'll assign all three dice onto this ritual board and we'll go over that in a second. Okay, so now what we're gonna say is we're gonna resolve, we do responses. So if anyone has any character abilities that they wanna to respond to, you have to ask, does anyone wanna to respond to my assignments? If no one does, they're ready to go. If people do wanna respond, then they will do their changes and such. And once that's done, then you're gonna resolve all these actions. So let's say no one did anything. I'm gonna resolve these. This will move this guy two spaces this way. This one will move this one space here. If this ever gets to the zero here, you get to uh, fire off any alter abilities. So let's, this one does have an alter ability. Uh, this one here, you're gonna gain two life. If you get the track down to zero, basically get both track down to zero, um, you get to do the keeper. So you get to keep it and you have a keeper benefit. In this case, during your roll phase, you get one additional die, which is pretty darn cool. Some of these guys have special things that have it when revealed or before the high priest roll phase. Whenever, uh, whoever has the least number of Kraken dice, one Kraken, uh, gains one Kraken die. If tied, it goes to the player with the most life. If still tied, all tied players gain one Kraken die. And we'll go over Kraken die in a minute, but some of them have when revealed bonuses. Some of them have alter bonuses when you finish something. Some of them have keeper bonuses, so you'll be able to keep that card. Now, keep in mind when you um, die as a wraith, you can no longer keep your keeper cards. They will go to the person that killed you. If you were killed by game effect, they would just go away. If you do resolve one of these rituals, it'll get discarded. If it's a keeper goes to you, like I said, then a new one will come out and the, this will be reset. These are actually set to the player count. So that's why it's eight if we play eight players and so on. One other thing to note too is if you dock a uh, die here with this symbol that matches your symbol on your card, you will gain one life when that resolves. And that's basically what that does. It doesn't actually resolve the effect of whatever the die is, it, you just gain a life. Now, that in a really brief gist is the beef of, or the bulk of the game. So, what you're going to be doing going throughout the game is you're going to be rolling those dice, resolving those dice, waiting to see if anyone responds to those dice, um, and then resolving, and then continuing on until one of the win conditions is met. One thing we do need to talk about is what happens if I die. So what happens if I get 16 wound tokens on this card? Well, what ended up happening is I the Cabalist was not re revealed. Now it is. Everyone knows I'm a Cabalist. I will choose one of the Wraith cards, and they're all you know, semi-different, so I get to pick uh, which one of these things I want to do. So this Cabal, or this um, Wraith here, uh, is going to, upon death, I gain these red dice. I'll get to roll them on my turn. It changes a little bit how I do things. Uh, during a living, and then this is my ability, during a living player's response phase, you may give one die to that player or discard one of your dice to remove a matching die. Uh, so this one here is a little different here. During a living player's response size, you may replace one die with one of your own. So that's the same idea. And then you get to discard the replaced die if you want, once per turn. So each of them are slightly different in their abilities, like so. You, but you get to pick through and pick which one you want to have. So basically on your turn, you're gonna be rolling these dice and you get the same uh, re-rolls that you would with a, a normal player turn. Uh, you just can't commit the dice. You're gonna commit the dice on other players' turns. So you can help complete rituals, you can damage people, you can heal people, you can do all sorts of fun stuff when you're a Wraith. And this Wraith card will go right over top of your normal player card. Some things you can't gain, if you, uh, you can never have a ritual. So if you had a ritual, they would be gone. You really can't complete rituals on your turn because you're signing stuff on other players' turns. And uh, you uh, can't be hurt. So you can't gain or lose life as a wraith. Now, as a side note, before we continue on, um, remember later on when you play with a necromancer, that changes the wraith a little bit. You can basically heal the wraith and become a player again. 
which is really cool. So, like I said, in a nutshell, that's going to be how you're going to play the game. That should get you enough uh, to get started with the game and enjoy it. Let's go head back up to the table here and I'll give you my final thoughts on Cult of the Deep. So I really like Cult of the Deep. I don't like social deduction games. I just don't. Uh, but I really love this game. And I, I, I don't know if it's a theme because I love Cthulhu-like themes. Or it's the fact that it's not really social deduction. You, I mean, it is and it isn't. I don't know how to explain it. It, it doesn't feel like I'm playing werewolf or anything like that. It feels like I can have super strategic decision making to be like extremely certain that certain people have different roles throughout the game. I do love that a lot. Um, and depending on what you do in the game, you can try to drive that out of each of the opponents. I like that a lot. One thing that I do want to mention that I didn't mention in the overview is the Kraken die. The Kraken die is pretty simple. If you have a Kraken die uh, at the beginning of your turn, you're going to roll it. And that's how much damage you're going to get. It's a four-sided die, so you can get up to four damage. Now, that's a lot of damage. And that could kill your character. What you can do is you can remove one of the cultist dice that you would have rolled for the turn before you roll and re-roll that Kraken die to hopefully get a lower number. But again, you're rolling less die on your turn, so you have to keep that in mind. Um, but, you know, re-rolling and potentially living is probably a little better than becoming a wraith, uh, especially if you are going to help along the high priest or other character to win the game. So something to consider. I love the fact that all the roles are interrelated. So because uh, they're straightforward in what their um, win conditions are, and you can look at that chart in the book, and I highly recommend that all players do, and maybe reference it throughout the game until you memorize the roles. And there's not that many, so it's not gonna, you know, like one or two games and you're gonna be good. Uh, that'll give you the ability to strategically determine what role each player is having. So, I really like this game. Like I said, I'm not sure if it's the theme, but I really think that the way that they have designed the game and the mechanics of the game are what uh, appeal to me. Um, and just, it's just fun. I mean, I, the decisions you get to make in the game are fun. It's always great to be like, haha, I'm just gonna start attacking people. Uh, one, you know, Pretty much revealing I'm a cultist or revengeful uh, priest or vengeful priest or, or something in that area. Or I am the high priest. I, everyone knows I'm the high priest. I don't have to hide. I can do whatever is the best strategy for myself. I can try to suss out those cultists and kill them. Other opponents might be trying to, you know, play off that this person's a cultist even though they are. So I throw some damage to them. A lot of decisions, a lot of really cool things to do. There's some uh, different modes in the back of the game that you can play, in the back of the rule book that you can use and play, so it gives more variety. But there's already a ton of variety in this game. There's a ton of different roles that you can be, or not roles, but there's a ton, ton of different characters you can be in the game, uh, and then match them up with roles. It gives a different feel every time. Uh, you get the different sigils, and having someone uh, have an unused sigil, you're just like, what the heck? I don't know what that is. It could be really bad. I don't know how much I want to mess with that person sort of thing. You know, really cool. And then how you go after those rituals. Like, are you going to go over and try to get the benefits? Do You don't want to do it too much because you don't want to help, unnecessarily help another player complete that ritual and, and, and steal that card from you if it's a keeper. Or uh, it may have a detrimental effect and you just want to get rid of it. Um, so everybody might be helping in completing that ritual. So there's a lot of different things to think about in this game. And as you can tell, I really like it. Uh, this uh, is one of my favorite social deduction games, which doesn't... It's a, it's a category of two games that I like for social de deduction, and this is one of them. So that's my thoughts on Cult of the Deep. Thank you for watching.